So we'll start with our, our mean. We've had all these distributions I've shown you, the Poisson distribution, binomial. We were going to talk about hypergeometric, but we'll still cover that today anyways, and so on and so forth. You have the uniform, all these distributions, or the discrete ones where it's just you know probabilities and numbers all over the place. A natural question you might ask yourself is, OK, what's the mean? The tricky part is with that, these probabilities aren't all weighted the same. So you can't just add them all up and divide by the number. It's not going to work. And to, cap, to compute the means in the, or averages, whichever term you prefer, of these distributions, it's useful to think of what the mean mu actually means. In this case, let's suppose we took all of y'all's grades on the first assessment, and we got the average together, and the average, I think, it was like a 77. The median was an 80. Let's just stick with 77 for now. Actually, I think it's probably a 78 now since somebody who had a zero dropped. So that 78, you might say that 78, if you randomly pick someone out of the class, on average, you'd expect them to be in the ballpark of a 78. And so we can say in English, another way to phrase our mean is to say the mean is what we would expect to get if we randomly pulled someone out of the class. Now they could get, they got a 58, but by the same token, they could have a 98, goes both ways. So we can say our mean is equal to our expected value. And we will denote this by E, capital E, not lowercase, use capital E because lowercase E is the, you know, the numerical constant E, Euler's number, E of X. So this E of X means it's, it's our, so we, on average, what we would expect to happen, you know, say, say we took two data points and we averaged them together. On average, that's what we would expect to get. So I say, okay, what's the point of this English lesson? What's the point of that? Well, the point of it is to make the next formula make a bit more sense. For a, a probability distribution, any probability distribution, where no two probabilities are necessarily the exact same, we can nonetheless still compute our mean by calculating the expected value. And this is equal to the sum of the products of our numbers times the probability of those numbers happening. Now to explain that notation, here's what happens. Let's say we have the numbers one, two, three, four, five. And just for simplicity, let's suppose they all have a 20% chance of happening. You could just average one, two, three, four, five together and get that correct. But let's just use that as a little bit of, as a bit of a check mark. We have the number one, and it has a 20% chance of happening. So xi, this is one, and the p probability corresponding to an x value of one is 20%. Does that make sense? So for example, I'll just write this all out. One, two, three, four, five. And then we have say 20%, 20%, 20%. Let's switch decimals, have fun. 0 0.2 and then 0 0.2. Those are all the same. You should be able to switch interchange between the two. In this case, this, we could call this X1. Oh, actually, well, Pete, uh, let, let's go to the left-hand side, make it a bit clearer. This, we can call that X1. This is X2, and so on and so forth, until this is X5. As a note, X5, for all we know, that five could be a six, doesn't matter. This basically X5 means this fifth data value in question. And therefore, this 20%, is the probability of getting X1, which here X1 is one, and this would be P X2, so on and so forth, all the way to P X5, okay? So now we have this little table as an example, let's actually see what this formula means. So we're gonna add up all of the products of a value and the probability of that value happening. So, for example, we have x1 as 1, so we'd have 1 times the probability of getting 1, which is 20%. Let's go to our next one. We have our next xi is 2. That's our x2. And the probability associated with getting 2, p of x2, is 20%. Our next x value is three. And the probability associated with getting three is 20%. Our next one is four. 
the probability of the probability associated with getting a four is 20%. But let's stick with the point to, you know, switch between notations. You should be able to easily switch between these two as you so need to. And our last X value is five. And the probability associated with that is 0.2. Now we just need to take all these products and then add them all together. So 20% of one is 0.2. 20% of two is 0.4. Or let's just use put these equal signs down now. 20% of three is 0.6. 20% of four is 0.8. And 20% of five is one. So therefore, these five numbers, they're right. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and one. These are our five products. And to give an analogy, you recall with, with the variance, we had to add up all of the squares of our differences. It's the same type of idea first. We do all the stuff on the inside first and then sum it all up. If it helps you, if you'd like to, you can put a parentheses around this to clearly indicate to you that you do that, all those first and then you add them all together. So in this case, let's add these all together. 0 0.2 plus 0.4, that's 0 0.6. Plus 0 0.6, 1.2 plus 0.8, that's two plus one, that's three. So our expected value is three, which is our mean. And sure enough, that lines up with what we'd already expect. Because since they all have equal probabilities, we could just say one plus two plus three plus four plus five, then divide that whole thing by five, which also gives us three. So that's a bit of a checkpoint for making sure that we're using it correctly. Any questions about this concept? Yes. Point two is twenty percent. Yes. The one, two, three, four, five, or the point two, point four, point six, point eight, and one. Mm hmm. It doesn't, they're all 20%. Yes, well, the thing is we multiply them together, think, think of this way. Let's say we were just asking ourselves, let's say we picked these numbers randomly and we saw on average, how many times did we get a five? You get, we get the five one time out of five, right? So that one time we got five. The other four times we didn't get a five, so we could say zero in that case, because zero is not five. We could do one, two, or three, but the, let's just stick with zero for the concept of it. So we got zero four times, and we got five the fifth time. Zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus five is five. We did it five times, five over five is one. That's where that 1.0 comes from. Same concept for the rest. Where's the chat? Is it over here? Yes, we add these all together. We add these five numbers to get our three. We add 0.2 to 0.4. So let me, let me uh, put the plus sign here. There we go, plus sign. We add them all together. Now, with the variance, the nice thing is the variance, the formula is nearly the exact same as, are, as you're used to. But when we think about this for a second, You'll notice this formula for the expected value looks a little bit different from the one that you're used to for the mean. Because with the mean, you added everything up and then you divided by your n. But let's do something a little bit magical here. In this case, these are all 20%. They're all weighted the same. So in this case, 20% is one over five, right? In this case, we have five data values. So let's let n be five. In this case, our summation would be our x1 over n, in this case, n is five, because 20%, one over five, I'm sticking with n, because we have five data values. You'll see why I'm sticking with this n with the firm mole. And then we have x2 over n, plus x3 over n, plus x4 over n, plus x5 over n. We can write this as the sum of our xi's divided by n. But since we're dividing by n at every single point, 
we can pull out that one over N. We can't pull out the XI because that XI changes. N never changes, XI does. So we can say this is equal to the sum of our X values over N. And now I'm pretty sure that looks very familiar to many of you because that's the definition for the average. The average that you're used to is really just a specific variant of this general formula for expected value. Essentially, we introduce you to the concept of an average by assuming you had an equal chance of getting every, any given number in question, say with exam scores. If I randomly pick someone's exam, you all have the same chance of being picked. So we get to skip the part with P of XI and simplify it to one over N. Now, we're not gonna make that assumption. We won't make that assumption this time, and therefore we have about as general a formula as you can get. You'll note when we, when we talked about the weighted averages, this is the same thing. This is the exact same thing. So we'll now introduce variance. Like before, we have variance is equal to our sigma squared. You remember that. Another way we can denote it, we can say it is denoted by the var of x. Pick whichever one you want. And in this case, the formula is going to start out the exact same as you're used to. Exact same as you're used to. The sum, we have our x size minus our mean squared. So the squares of our differences. The only difference is this time, we can't just divide by n at the end because they have different probabilities. So now we instead have the p of xi. So let's work through an example and let's use the same example we had up here. Let's copy this down. Here we go. And as a note, uh, we're going to do it with the probabilities that are the same, just so you can clearly understand the relationship between this formula and the one you've already seen. And you'll know, even if we change these probabilities, the process that I show you will be the exact same. Now, in this case, we need, we recall, we need to first get the squares of our differences. So we'll set up our table the same way as before. We have our xi minus mu squared. And our five data points are one, two, three, four, and five. So we've already computed our mean. Our mean is three. So we're going to start off same way as before. Even though the probabilities might change, the process that you start this will be the exact same. So we'll have one minus three squared. And here the one is our xi. The mu we already calculated is three. It's not going to change. Two minus three squared. Three minus three squared. Four minus three squared and five minus three squared. So one minus three, negative two, square that, we get four. Two minus three, negative one square, we get one. I'm just gonna save you some time and write down the rest because you all know how to do basic math. Here's where we change it. We don't add these up now because the catch is they might have different probabilities. In this case, we technically could, because they all have the same weighting, but this is just for the purpose of explaining it. Here, now what we're gonna do is multiply by the probability of it happening. We have this P of XI. The probability of getting one, not four, one. That's our XI, XI is one, not four in this case. The probability of getting one is 20%. So 0.2. The probability of getting two is 20%. They're all 20%, so we multiply them all by 0.2. Four times 0.2 is four fifths, so that'll be 0.8. Same thing down here, because it's the same calculation. 0.2 of one, that's just 0 0.2, 0 0.2, zero. Now we add them all together. 0.8 plus 0.2 is 1, plus 0.2, 1.2, plus 0.8, that's 2. That's it. We're done. We don't have to divide by n because we've already accounted for that with our different probabilities. And just as a spot check so that you know it's correct, here's how we know it's correct. Let's suppose we use the formula that we're used to, and we instead added all of these up and then divided by n, which is 5. 4 plus 1 is 5, plus 1 is 6, plus 4 is 10. We then divide by five and we get two, which matches exactly what we just got. 
And this is why I use the equal probabilities for the purpose of showing it to you. So that way you can clearly see the relationship between the two formulas. Let's say, for example, we change this point to, or the 20% to a 30% and this 20% to a 10%. The only thing that changes is that this two would become a three and this two would become a one. That's it. Everything else is the exact same. And just as a final point of reinforcement before I take any questions, if you have any, let's show that in this example, these two formulas come out to be the exact same. So we have the sum of our xi's minus our mu's times p of xi. In this case, our p of xi is 1 over 5, which we'll say 1 over n because n is 5. So in this case, we have the sum of our xi's minus mu times 1 over n. Like with before, we'll pull out the 1 over n. So we have the sum, I'm sorry, squared. I forgot the squared, sorry, squared. The sum of our x i's minus mu squared over n. Lo and behold, that's exactly what you've seen already. The nice thing about this one is that this formula that I've shown you right here works no matter what the probabilities are. The one you've seen before only works if they're all weighted the same. Someone say something? Okay. So any questions about this? Yes. Let me go up a little bit so you can see it better. Yeah. What does what represent? This two is our variance. So let me write that down, variance. And as you'll note, the nice thing is the standard deviation, the process is the exact same. Once you calculate the variance, square root that and you get the standard deviation. The only thing that changes here is we calculate the variance slightly differently, which in more mathematical terms, is the generalized formula. Now, here's the nice thing. With discrete probability distributions, like, you know, for example, say we have five data values, they have different probabilities, you'll use this. When we get to the binomial, Poisson, hypergeometric, and continuous uniform, I will give you formulas so you can skip all the work. So with that said, let's do a practice problem. I'll give you all a moment or two to do it. It's right here. Go ahead and find the mean, variance, and standard deviation. Do it in that order, because you need the mean to get the variance. And then once you get the variance, you square root it. I'll leave it right here, and I'll give you about two or three minutes to do it. And then once we cover this, we'll start going relatively quickly and writing down some formulas. Uh, yes, Brandon, you can use Desmos. On the exam, you'll be allowed to open tabs. There are three links in the exam, two for uploading your submissions and one for Desmos. You'll be, you should be able to click those and open them up. If they won't open up by clicking, you can just copy paste them into your browser tab. If you open anything else besides one of those three, it will tell me. But you will be able to use Desmos to make calculations a bit easier on now, you'll still have to show where your stuff's coming from, but it'll save you some of the rudimentary calculations and save you quite a bit of time. Now, what we're going to do here is I want you all to calculate the mean, then we'll go over the mean, and then you'll do the variance on your own. So that way you don't get the wrong variance by having the wrong mean. So I'll give you about another minute to find the mean, which is the expected value, and then we'll go over that.
All right, does anyone need any extra time for the mean, which is our expected value? All right, let's go over the expected value, and then I'll have you continue with the remaining two, because I don't want you to accidentally get the wrong answer because you didn't get the mean correctly. So our expected value, E of X, is equal to the sum of our XIs times the probability of getting those XIs. So in this case, our first XI is zero, and the probability associated with that is 0.1. So we have zero times 0.1. Our next one, our XI is one, and the probability of getting one is 0.2. Our next one, our X value is two, and the probability of getting two is 0.4. Our next one is three, and the probability of getting three is 0.2. And our last one is four, and the probability of getting four is 0.1. Zero times 0 0.1, zero. One times 0 0.2 is just 0 0.2. Two times 0 0.4 is 0 0.8. Let me make that more clearly a two. Three times 0 0.2 is 0 0.6. Four times 0 0.1 is 0 0.4. 0 0.2 plus 0 0.8 is one, plus 0 0.6 plus 0 0.4 is two. And this is our mean. So now with that, go ahead and compute the variance and standard deviation. Recall the variance is the one you focus on. If your variance is correct, you just square root that and you get your standard deviation. I've changed the, the F to a P, so it's clear notation for you. And we'll go over the answer to this at about 29 or 30, probably 30. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The calculation's easier than the formula makes it look. Uh, Brandon, on the exam, it'll be assessed implicitly. What's going to happen is I will have you calculate mean and standard deviation and whatnot on the exam, but you'll have easier formulas you can use for it. For the web work, you're going to have a problem like this, so get used to it anyways. Essentially, for the distributions where the calculations can get much more complicated, I will give you actual explicit formulas that make it easier on you. Since this class is not a necessarily a proof class. I'm not going to go and prove as to why they're the case, because this is more so an applications focused class. We'll just assume that it's the case. All right, does anyone need an extra 30 seconds or so? Okay.
All right, we're gonna go and go over it. We recall the process starts out the same. Let's make our table. Zero, one, two, three, four. And we still know, that went down quite a bit. We still need to calculate our XI's minus our means squared. In this case, our mean is two. That two is never gonna change. So we have zero minus two squared, one minus two squared. Uh, we're going a bit down. Let's move this down a little bit so we can see it better. There we go. Two minus two squared, three minus two squared, and four minus two squared. So, zero minus two, negative two squared is four. Same down here, one minus two, negative one squared, that is one. Same down here, and that one is zero. This is where we change things. We don't add them all up now. We now multiply them by their probabilities. In this case, the probability associated with getting zero is 0.1. Likewise, 0.1 is also the probability associated with getting four. 0.2 is our probability associated with getting one. So we're going to multiply our one by 0.2. And likewise, 0.2 is also our probability associated with getting three. So this is our three that we multiply by 0.2. No, when I say three, I mean this three, not the one, the three. And finally, the probability of getting two is 0.4. So we multiply by 0.4. So I'll do one big equal sign. Four times 0.1 is 0.4. Same down here. One times 0.2. That's just 0.2, same down here. Zero times 0.4 is zero. Now we add them all up. 0.4 plus 0.2 is 0.6, plus 0.4 is one, plus 0.2, 1.2. And that is our variance. And we just, so this is our variance, sigma squared. And so the square root of 1.2 is our standard deviation. Any questions? All right, now we're going to start getting some, to some fast and furious formulas with regards to distributions. What I'm going to do, I'm going to give you the formulas for binomial, Poisson, and the uniform distribution. And those will significantly speed up your calculations for finding the mean and the variance. I'm not going to give you the formula for standard deviation because all you have to do is square root the variance and get that. So let me double check. There's nothing in chat I've missed. All right. Let's go over here, formula time. All right, so first we're gonna start off with the binomial. I'm just gonna abbreviate it. Here we go. This one is very nice and easy. Our expected value, which is our mean, is equal to N times P. That's it. And you'll recall N is the number of trials and P is the probability of getting a success. And the variance, so we'll say var of x, which is sigma, oh, that is not a sigma, that's a zero. Sigma squared is equal to n times p times one minus p. Again, n is the number of trials and p is the probability of getting a success. You will notice this is much easier than using those formulas. Now, if this was math 2300, I go ahead and prove why this is the case, but we just care about the formula itself. As a very quick and easy example, let's suppose that, let me pull that up. Come on, where'd it go? Sure. Uh, which one do you need typed? Oh, uh, Brandon, I'll upload my notes that have the formulas as well. So that'll actually should be easy on you. So as an example, let's suppose we're flipping that coin. Come on. Let's suppose we're flipping that coin and we flip it six times and we will know the expected value for heads and tails along with the variance. So in that case, so we'll say coin where we have N equals six and obviously P is 0 0.5. The expected value six times 0.5, three, that's it, you're done. Nothing else to it. I don't think you can get much easier than that. The variance, we have n times p, which is three. And then one minus p is 0.5. So 
still 0.5. So three times 0.5 is 1.5. That's it, you're done. It's as easy as that. So if it helps, you can write the variance as saying it's equal to the mu times one minus P, pick whichever one you want. So in here we'd have NP is equal to six times 0.5 which is three, and then NP times one minus P is three times one minus 0.5, which is three times 0.5, which is 1.5. Doesn't get much easier than that, folks. Actually, it does get easier. <laughs> let's now, oh, this is in the way. Let's move this down a little bit. Let's make things even easier. Now, let's do the Poisson distribution. Well, here, our expected value is equal to our mu. Well, guess what? With the Poisson, we give you the mu. Like you know, with the cars, the average number of cars is five. That's our mu. Now for the real fun. The variance is an extraordinarily nasty, terrible formula. Very nasty, isn't it? Very terrible, very hard to calculate. With the Poisson distribution, the variance and the mean are the exact same thing. So let's say you go into that exam and it says, you know, you have cars going through a drive through and on average nine go through. What's the mean and the variance? They're both nine. That's it. There's not even any calculating to do. And likewise, the standard deviation, all you have to do is square that variance and you're done. Yes. That's an X. The va variance of X. That's just another way of denoting the variance. Let me pull this up. The Poisson distribution. Poisson. There we go. There you go. So I don't think there's much of an example to do there because <laughs> it's it, the, the, but really with the Poisson getting the mean and the uh, standard deviation, well, mean and the variance, it's just reading the problem. Standard deviation, you square root, that's it. Now, finally, the uniform distribution. We recall, let me move this down a little bit more, give us some more space. There we go. Now the uniform. Now our uniform, everything has the same probability of happening. So think of it like a big flat rectangle. This is our low, this is our high, and these are all our P of XIs. They all have the same chance of happening, every single one of them. So if I'm picking, if I'm picking your assessment scores and I randomly pick a student, that's a uniform distribution from who I'm picking from because you all have the same chance of being picked. With the uniform, the only two things you need are the low and the high. That's it. You don't need anything else in between. So for the uniform, our expected value, which is our mu, is equal to the max. Or in this case, let's, let's stick with high and low. High plus low divided by two. All right. So for example, if we had three to five, it'd be five plus three over two, that's four. Yes. Pardon? Because it's a halfway point. Now the variance, I feel like there might supposed to be a plus sign here, but I'll write this down anyways. I feel like there might supposed to be a plus sign here. I'm pretty sure it actually is. So I'm gonna write it down with the plus sign. The high plus the low squared over 12. My sheet has minus. I feel like it's supposed to be plus. But I'll double check that while you're doing some practice problems. So for example, if the low is 20 and the high is 100, the mean 100 plus 20 is 120 divided by 260. That's it. Now we have one for hypergeometric. We'll do that at the end. So what I'm going to do is we're going to pull up a few practice ones. Uh, let's start with this one right here. This one's for Poisson. If you're in person, take a picture of it so that I can double check that I have the correct formula before we actually get to uniform. For those of you at home, it'll just keep screen sharing so you can go right ahead. This one should take you no more than one minute to do. Yes. 
Pardon? 12. For the variance, we divide by 12. All right, I'll give you a moment to do this. Let me turn this off for just a moment, and I will double check that I have the signs correct. Oh, come on. Oh, it was correct. Okay. Let me switch back on. So it is the minus. Okay, it was just the one that was wrong. There we go. So my sheet was correct. Okay. This is just a minus. All right, let's go back over here. This should take you at best 30 seconds to do. <laughs> Yeah, so if you if you didn't see, I just pull it up right here. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, it ran away. Whatever, who cares? Uh, the, 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 the formulas, I will upload a note sheet for that. I need to bring my mouse pad. Let me zoom out a little bit so you can see it. So that's high plus low over two. This is high minus low over 12. Okay. So let's go over this one. This is Poisson distribution. If, if, you, if you recall from last time for Poisson, we require things to be independent. It's over time, and any occurrence during one time interval is independent of any other one. That's the thing you see right there up above. So the average number is five. Our mean is five. The variance is equal to the mean. So the variance is also five. And the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So standard deviation is the square root of five. That is it. You're done. On the exam, you're going to see a problem like this, and it'll it should be a freebie. And the, about the biggest amount of work you'll have to do is write down the mean is five, the variance is five, and the standard deviation is a square root of five. That's it. Very nice and easy. Let's go to one with the uniform distribution a bit further down here. This one is uniform. You can tell because everything is the same chance of happening. So go ahead and try this one. Should only take maybe 30 seconds at best. Anyone need more time? Okay. The mean is equal to the max minus the min divided by two. In this case, our max plus, sorry, plus, 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 plus. The max is 40. The min is 30. And we divide by two. 40 plus 30 is 70. Divided by two, 35 minutes. That's it. The variance is slightly more involved, but not much more. This is equal to the max minus the min squared, all divided by 12. So in this case, now we do the minus. 40 minus 30 squared over 12. 40 minus 30 is 10. Square that. We have 100. So 100 over 12. And web work, you could put an over 100 over 12, that's fine. If you wanted to further simplify it, they both have a common denominator of four. So we could say 25 over three, and you can just leave it there if you want. Or you can make it decimal 8.333. It'll take any of those. Any questions about those? All right, 
Let's see if I can find where I put the binomial one. We'll get to that in a second. Here we go. Here's the binomial one. This one is binomial. And the reason why you know it's binomial is because it's defective or it's not. So find the mean variance of standard deviation of this one. Should all, you should only need maybe 30 seconds for this. Uh, the next exam, uh, it's going to be four problems, but they'll have multiple parts. On average, I, I think if you took them all together, it's roughly, I guess you could say 20 parts total. But some of them are extraordinarily simple, like that one you just did for uniform and whatnot. A lot of them are very straightforward. All right, does anyone need more time? All right, let's go over this. This is binomial. So our mean is equal to N times P. We pick 200 samples. So 200 is our N. Our probability is 0.7, which we can write as seven over 100 or 7%, whichever one you want. So that's just two times seven, which is 14. That's it, nothing else to it. Now our variance, we'll say sigma squared is NP times one minus P. We recall NP is our mu, so mu times one minus P. In this case, our mu is 14 times one minus 0 0.07. So we have 14 times 0.93. I don't know that off the top of my head. Let me pull up a calculator. All right, and that would be 13.02. And finally, the standard deviation, sigma, is the square root of sigma squared. So the square root of 13.02, which is approximately 3.608. On the exam, this is all the work you have to show. Now for this one, you don't get to pull numbers out of your butt. You still got to show where it's coming from, but I care more so that you know what to use instead of all the rudimentary calculations. Yes. No, you, you can put the square, basically standard deviation, you can say standard deviation is square root of the variance, which therefore is this. All right. Now, one more practice problem for you before we move on. Expected value, same formula as before, but here's the catch. What I'm gonna do is show you a little sneaky way around this. I'll show you how to do it. This will show up on the exam, but I'm gonna show you the, the sneaky way around it. So the normal way to do it is find the probability of getting an A and the probability of getting a B and the probability of getting a C and the probability of getting an F. So in this case, we have 26 students. So that'd be eight over 26, 12 over 26, and six over 26. Then you'd multiply those by four, three, two, and one, add them all up and you're done. I'm gonna show you a shortcut. Here's the shortcut. Our A is four. And here that would be eight over 26 because the probability we have 26 people total. And then here we'd have 3.0 times 12 over 26. Plus, in this case, we have 2.0, so 2 times 6 over 26. If you want, you can just do that. You're fine. You'll get full credit for it. You can see it's nice and easy. So just to finish this out, we have 4 times 8. We'd have 32 over 26. 3 times 12 would be 36 over 26. 2 times 6 is 12 over 26. Add those together, 
32 plus 12, 44, plus 36 is 80. And you could put that in, that'd be fine. Or we can put it in decimal form, which is about a 3.077. On the exam, you could put either of those. I'll take them both. Now, I'll show you the cheap way. Well, not cheap, but the fast way. Four times eight. We have eight people getting a 4.0. Because here's why. When we say expected GPA, that's the same thing as the average. But we recall that formula from before is the same as the weighted average. So let's cheat in a good way. Plus three times 12 people plus six times our 2.0. So two times six. Think of it, this is all of the GPA points they've earned. So if we divide all the GPA points they've earned by the number of them that there are, that's our mean, which is our expected value. The way we do the sneaky way around it is by using English. Hey, English class finally helps you. So in this case, Four times eight is 32. Three times six is 36. Two times six is 12. That's 80. So think of this way. These 26 students earned 80 GPA points between them. Divide that by the number of students and we're done. So pick whichever way you want. I'm fine with either. Let me see if anyone had a question. All right. Now... I'll work one more with you, and then we will go to Z-scores. So here, $1,000 if someone has theft, risk of a loss is one in 200, what's a fair premium? When we say, now this isn't gonna show up on the exam, but I think it's on the web work. When we say fair, the idea behind it is that no one's making a profit. The consumers aren't getting screwed, but they're also not getting a really big bang for their buck. In this case, 199 of our people are gonna pay some premium, let's call it, lowercase, and nah, let's call it F, fair premium. They're gonna pay some premium F, and our remaining one person is also gonna pay that one premium F. And this needs to be equal to $1,000. Why 1,000? Because the idea behind it is all of the money this insurance company takes in its premiums, they're gonna to have to pay it out because of you know insurance, something happening, something bad happening, in this case, theft. So the idea behind it is all the premiums should cover the cost that they have to pay for someone actually having an issue. So we use some algebra, 199 plus one, 200F is equal to 1,000. So F is equal to $5. So in this case, a fair premium is $5. Essentially, when we say fair or web work asks you for fair, it's asking you for what's called the break-even point. At what dollar value does everyone break even, i.e. the customers aren't getting screwed and the insurance company is not getting screwed. Okay, any questions about that? The math is very simple. It's more so a conceptual type of thing. All right, let's go back to Z-scores. Don't do this yet. The Z-score formula to help you is still the exact same. It is the exact same. It is still the exact same. The catch is that when we were doing the previous unit, we only dealt with Z scores that were integers. Now we're gonna go into decimals. So calculate the five, the, the six Z scores associated with these exam scores. This should take you about a minute. There's nothing for me to show. It's just establishing that you understand we can go into decimals. You'll see why we go into decimals on Thursday. Uh, sigma, that's our standard deviation. Uh, for those in Zoom who asked about me typing it out, the issue is that the keyboard doesn't have the mu and it doesn't have the sigma, so I can't type that out. I have to write it out. Note, for all of these, 
Every single time you use the formula, mu is going to be the same and sigma is going to be the same. The only thing that changes is your xi. Let's save us a little bit of space. I'm going to move this over here. Save us a little bit of space. Does anyone need more time? All right, let's go through. Calculations all going to be the exact same. The only thing that changes our x size. So this one, our x size is 50. Our mu is 77. We divide the whole thing by eight. So in this case, we have negative 27 over eight, which I believe is negative 3.375. That is a really goofy looking five. There we go. Next one, 60 minus 77 over eight, that's a seven. So we have negative 17 over eight, which I believe is negative 2.125. You'll have a calculator on the exam. If you don't know how to put it to decimals, that's fine. The catch is on the exam. When it comes to Z scores, no fractions. Z scores have to go to decimals on the exam. You will see why when we get to the next chapter. Our next one, 70, we have 70 minus 77 over eight. This is negative seven eighths, which is negative 0 0.875. Next one, 80 minus 77 over eight. This is three over eight, which is 0 0.375. Next one, 90 over seven, or 90 minus 77 divided by eight. That is 13 over eight, which I believe is 1.625. Don't have a question, so I heard a mic get unmuted. One of you's hot miking, by the way. All right, in our last one, we have 100 minus 77 over 8. That's 23 over 8, which I believe is 2.875. That's it. Now, Let's say I asked you, what's the probability of being lower than 2.875? Right now, you couldn't answer that because you only have the empirical rule. On Thursday, I'm going to show you how to calculate that. But for now, I just want to show you that we can go into decimals. Now, let's do something else with z-scores. Let's work backwards. We've worked backwards before. Let's work backwards again. For here, I'll show you how to work backwards. And the next one, you'll do it yourself. So here, we have an x value of 2 corresponds to a z score of one. So our z score corresponding to x being two is gonna be the x value, which is two, minus our mean, which we don't know, divided by the standard deviation, which we don't know. But we know what z2 is, z2 is negative one. Our other one, we have a z score of two, corresponding to an x value of 11 minus mu over sigma. This is a system of two equations. You know how to solve this from algebra one. I'll solve it for you. you when you're solving these, use the same process I'm using. It's the easiest one. And I'll give you an example where you can do it on your own. First, multiply out the sigmas. So negative one times sigma, we have negative sigma is equal to two minus mu. And in this case, we have two sigma is equal to 11 minus mu. Now, we're going to subtract 11 from both sides. So 2 sigma minus 11 is equal to negative mu. And in this case, negative sigma minus 2. Let me make that a bit clearer. Is equal to negative mu. We have a negative mu both times. We can now equate the same side of the equation. So therefore, these are equal. So negative sigma minus two is equal to two sigma minus 11. Let's add 11 to both sides. Negative two plus 11 is nine. Add sigma to both sides, three sigma. Divide by three, three is our value of sigma. 
Now, we can plug this back into either of them. You can pick whichever one you want. Uh, we have a question. There we go. Uh, in this case, let's use one on the left because that's easier. Negative sigma, so negative three. Let's bring this down. So negative three is equal to two minus mu. Add mu to both sides, add three to both sides. So then we have mu is equal to five. We're done. The nice thing about this is we can take these two values and verify we have the correct answer. So for example, with this one, two minus five is negative three divided by three, negative one equals negative one. The nice thing about these problems, you can check that you have the correct answer by just plugging them back in. So now I'll give you one you to try it on your own. It should only take a minute or two. Here's one right here. Try this one on your own. It doesn't matter that we have decimals. The process is the exact same. So I'll give you about a minute or two to do this. Uh, sure. And you'll note when I say A and B main standard deviation, that's just asking you to solve the problem and solve for those two variables. On the exam, you're going to see a problem like this. All right, one more minute and then we'll go over it. Does anyone need more time? Okay. We start setting it up same way as before. Z score of negative 1.4 corresponds to an X value of three minus mu over sigma. That, I, this, this the sigma is kind of hard to write. That's a sigma. And our other one, a Z score of negative 0.2 corresponds to an X value of nine minus r mu over sigma. Let's multiply out the sigmas, negative 1.4. I'm also gonna subtract the three at the same time. So I'm multiplying by sigma, then subtracting by three. Minus three is negative mu. Negative 0.2 times sigma, so negative 0.2 sigma. We'll subtract the nine from, that is a horrible looking sigma. Let me try that again. There we go minus nine, and that's equal to negative mu. We've equated it, now we solve. Negative 1.4 sigma minus three is equal to negative 0.2 sigma minus nine. Let's add nine to both sides, negative three plus nine is six. Add 1.2 sigma to both sides, negative 0.2 plus 1.4 is 1.2 sigma. And if you divide everything by 1.2, five equals sigma. There we go. Now we'll plug it back in. We're gonna plug it back in to this one. So it's a bit easier. So we have negative mu is equal to negative 0 0.2 times sigma, which is five minus nine. 
So negative mu. So we have negative 0.2 times five, that's negative one minus nine. Negative mu is equal to negative 10. So therefore mu is equal to 10. Any questions? All right, time for hypergeometric. We should finish on time and be good to go. All right, let's go down here where we have the space. Hypergeometric time, get ready for the nastiest formula in the entire class. No sarcasm there. The hypergeometric distribution And here before I even write the formula, I'm gonna tell you what the letters mean in advance. In this case, X is equal to the number of successes. N is equal to the number of trials. Capital N is our population size. And R are the number where R is the number of population elements that are a success. So as an example, if we had a deck of 52 cards and it had four aces and we're looking for aces, the, uh, and let's say we wanted to find the odds of getting at least three aces, X is three, we did four trials, so lowercase n is four. Our population, we have 52 cards, so capital N would be 52. And R, we, we would have four aces in the entire deck, so R would be four. Yes, this will all be in my notes. And this applies, I'm gonna type now because I can fully type this easily. This is for use of success fail when binomial doesn't apply. All right, it is now time for the form. Yep. Let's stay away from the formula of doom as long as we can. <laughs> Actually, I don't think that's gonna pop up. So uh, the formula for variance and standard deviation will be in the notes. You can look those up if you want. I don't think I have that on the exam, so you'll be fine. As a note, if you want to, you can say P is equal to R over N, if that helps you. X are the, so R in our population, that's how many successes we have. X is how many successes we're looking for. So if we're picking cards out of a deck of cards and we're looking for aces, there are four aces in the deck but I might ask you, what are the odds of getting one ace? In that case, X is one. R and the two Ns will never change for when, when I give you the scenario. The only thing that changes are your Xs. So no more delaying, time for the big fat ugly formula. I might have to move this over a little bit to the left to give us some space. All right, here we go. I'm going to start with a denominator because the denominator is easier and you'll see the denominator is not pretty. I'm gonna make the line about this big because that's how much space I'm gonna need. Let's start with the denominator. Our denominator is N capital N factorial divided by lowercase n factorial times capital N minus lowercase n factorial. We make that N as clear as possible. Okay, now the numerator. Let's start with the easy part of it. The easy part is R, oh, that's an N, I want R. Oh, oh I just clicked the save button. Is R factorial divided by X factorial times R minus X factorial. I'll wait a second you have that. Those aren't so bad. The next part is the disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna draw a very big parenthesis so I have the space. Here we go. The numerator's not that bad. It's N minus R factorial. Now for the doozy. We have N minus X factorial in the denominator. And then the remaining part, Capital N 
minus lowercase n minus r minus x, and that whole thing factorial. That is the big, fat, nasty formula of Doom. There are easier ways to write it, but the calculation still stays the same. I figured I'd just give you the whole big thing and get all the letters. And I, I have checked this about 20 times. The letters are correct. So yeah, and we denote this entire, oh, we denote this entire thing. This is H of X hypergeometric. That is the big fat formula of Doom. Yeah. Preston, I'm sure y'all are very glad that you get to have a formula sheet. There is no way in hell I'd make you memorize this. That, that's just sadism. Yes. Yes. You're going to have a hypergeometric part on the net. It's only going to be one part. It's going to be on there. In the practice exam, I work through an example for hypergeometric, and I'm going to work through a hypergeometric for you right now. But let's do a little bit of sneaky work. I'm going to save you the calculations. Here I'm going to do it. I'm going to switch over to our friendly little fun calculator of happiness that makes us all very happy inside. Here's what we're going to do. Let's type out that whole big nasty thing. Here we go. So we have our three parentheses. Let's start with the bottom because the bottom's the easiest part. N factorial. The bottom, lowercase n factorial times n minus n factorial. When you are doing the exam, save yourself some time and do what I'm doing here. I, there's a video that I uploaded to one of the lecture material folders or something where I go over typing these in. So if you need help on that, that's there for you. And here we have the r factorial, x factorial, r minus x factorial. And then over here, the big nasty part, n minus r factorial. Oh, no, 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 capital N. And then down here, n minus x factorial. And then our parentheses, n minus n minus r minus x factorial. What will happen, you'll see these buttons pop up. Click all to add them all. Pull that up. Yes. So, and then from here, I will call this h of x, oh, lowercase x, is equal to that. That's how, yes. Where? Oh, sometimes it won't show the whole thing. All right. The hardest part is typing it in. Now I'm going to show you an example on, on, on the uh, thing. I'm going to work through it for you to save us some time because I said we're going to finish early and we will. Now I'm actually going to show you all a video that will go past, but you have to stay for it. I think you all might like it. So let's switch over to the example. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you one minute on the example, not to calculate it, but to identify our variables, capital N, lowercase n, x, and r. So for this example down here, I want you for, first of all, without doing A, B, and C, identify capital N, lowercase n, and r. Identify those three. I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. Oh yes, at the share screen, I'm sorry. Oh, what am, I, what am I doing? Sorry, let me share. I apologize, I forgot to share the screen. Here we go. So don't do A, B, and C yet. You're not gonna calculate anything for those. I'll calculate them for you. Identify capital N, lowercase n, and R. So in this case, capital N is 52 because that's how many cards we have. So in this case, we have n equals 52. We're choosing four cards at random. So lowercase n is equal to four. There are four aces in the deck because we're looking to pick aces. So r is equal to four. Now for these parts, let's talk about x. We're asking for the odds of not getting a single ace. So x is gonna be zero, one, two, three, or four. How do you think it's gonna be four? Three, two, one, zero. Yes, our X is zero because we want to see the odds getting no aces. 
Now, exactly two aces, our x is going to be two, looking for exactly two. Odds of getting every single ace, that's going to be x4. So let's calculate those probabilities with our formula. So I'm going to switch back over to this. Here we go. In this case, now notice the R never changes. It's four. Our capital N was 52 and the lowercase n was four. Okay. Now, we wanted the odds of getting no aces whatsoever. That's H of zero. The odds of getting no aces is 72%. Not good. So if we pick four cards at random, about every four times we get at least one ace, the other three, nothing. Now we ask, what are the odds of getting exactly two aces? In this case, if you want, you can literally put X equals two. It'll, it, it will, eh, I guess I don't want to do that. H of two, the odds of getting exactly two aces are 2.5%. Not good. Now let's do the odds of getting all four. We switch the two to a four. Not happening. <laughs> that's, that's the order of 10 to the negative seven, I think. I think that's 3.7 to the negative seven or times 10 to the negative seven. You're just not getting all four. So in this case, I'll, I'll switch back to the whiteboard and write those down. And I, I, there is a video on Blackboard where I go over examples involving all three of the distributions. If you need extra help typing those in, I strongly recommend watching it. So you write this down. The probability of not getting a single ace was 72%. The probability of getting two was 2.5%. The probability of getting it all was like 10 to the negative seven. Let me pull up the chat. Here's a catch though. In web work, if you change that 10 to the negative seven to a zero, it's not gonna take it. So technically we're done with material. If you wanna leave now, you can. I'm gonna show you a video I pre-recorded to help you understand these probabilities. So let me pull it up. If you wanna leave now, you can. We're, we technically finished before time, like I promised. But I'm gonna show you all a video that I think hopefully Many of y'all will appreciate. Make this big. All right, I'm going to share this video screen for those of you at home. Are those of you at home able to see this? All right, I'm gonna play this for just a moment. And for those of you who are at home, let me know if you can at least hear it. All right, so we went over these, prop were those of you at home able to hear that? All right, I'm going to place. It's nine minutes. If you want to leave, you can. If you don't want to watch, that's fine with you. I'm not holding it against you. I just figured for many of you, you might find this to be helpful in explaining the concepts. The card video? Sure, I can do that. All right, enjoy. Abilities with a deck of 52 cards of certain amount of aces we might get, whether it's zero, one, or perhaps even four. And we saw they were wildly different possibilities. And I figured it would be helpful to give you a visual regarding the problem that you actually just did. So you have a deck of cards and I will note, it's an actual deck of cards. They're not gimmick to have front and back specials or anything. And we're just gonna work with one deck of cards. We're not gonna switch things out because this is the purpose for explaining things. So let's open it up and take our cards out. There's the inside of the deck if you want to see it. And let's focus on these 52. Now I'm going to go through these so you can see them all. And what I want you to keep track of, see how many aces you see and count how many face down cards you see. So let's go through. You can see our face down cards are all over the place. You'll note that our face up cards are very clearly randomly mixed. Right down to the last card. Okay. Now, if you were counting, you will have seen that there were no aces and four face down cards. So by logical deduction, it'd be reasonable to assume that those four face down cards were the aces. So let's randomly select four cards, but we're just gonna take the face up ones. That's one. That's two. That's three. 
That's four. But the thing is, we cheated. That's not random sampling. Nowhere close. It just isn't. And, you know, we can turn this sideways and we can see those aces, they were all over the place. But that wasn't random sampling. We want to actually see what happens when we truly start randomly picking out cards. And so what we're going to do, square this up. Let's go through and flip all of those aces back over. There we go. There we go. Our third one. That's the third. Oh, come on. There we go. And our last one. Seems like it's a bit near the bottom. There we go. Square them up. And now everything stays down. And indeed, just to show you, no shenanigans with regards to face up and face down. We just keep going all the way to the very last card. So, first thing we can do is to start flipping, like randomly cutting and checking. That's four of hearts. Doesn't work. Hey, there's one ace. That's five. And that's a two. But there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, we didn't pick four at once. And second of all, that, that was replacement. Now, the probability would still roughly stay the same. It would slightly change. It would slightly increase our odds of getting an ace, assuming we'd already gotten one. But the point of that is you can see it's still certainly possible to get at least one ace. Not great, but possible. So let's actually take four cards at once. Let's cut the deck in four random places. I would note, I will tell you truthfully, those were four randomly selected parts of the deck. Let's check the top card of each. See how we did. That's a king. That's a nine. That's a five. That's a queen. No luck whatsoever. Now, let's say check the bottom one of each. That would still be random because they were randomly cut. Let's check the bottom one of each. That's an eight. No luck. Hey, there's one ace. There's a nine of diamonds and a two of hearts. Sorry, you can see that ace there. That's not the one we picked. So we got one ace, but so far we've done three tries and only one of them was truly without replacement. We only got one ace. So we can see getting at least one ace, it's certainly possible. A 28% chance is not guaranteed, but it's absolutely possible. But let's suppose we take these, flip them back over. And just for some good measure, let's flip them around. Do a bit of extra mixing for extra randomness. And let's randomly cut one each, see how we do. Jack, nope. 10, nope. Six, nope. And queen, nope. And boy, we, we can see we got the one ace at least once, but the majority of the time, we didn't even get one ace. Move that up a little bit so you can see it better. And the point is to illustrate that with the probability of getting even at least one ace, it's not great. It's possible, but not super likely. Let's now put them back in order. Last time we did a clockwise, so let's do counterclockwise just to give them an extra mix for good measure. Now, something we can do is called it's called judgment sampling. Let's say we took the top four cards. One, two, three, four. No luck. And just for extra measure, let's throw them to the bottom. So we've gotten one ace, but we still are trying to get four. We're just getting nowhere close. <laughs> so now let's try, say, systematic random sampling. Let's say we can take the first card and every nth card after that. So let's say the first card and every 11th card. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 
and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. No, I was not pulling cards off the bottom of the deck. So this means we have eight cards left over. Hopefully, none of them are an ace. Let's check. No aces, that's good. But still, that means we still have 44 cards left. The odds aren't that great. And notice that's an example of conditional probability. Let's square up the cards. Move this up a little bit so you can see it better. And let's see how we did. So since we took the first card and every 11th card after that, that would be the bottom card of each of these decks. So let's check. Nope. 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 And no. At least we're on our way to a flush, but no aces. And the point of this video and these cards is to illustrate to you that getting even one ace with four random cards, those odds aren't great. Getting even four, you might as well forget about it. But here's the thing. Sorry, this is a little bit bent. If you go into web work and you round that 10 to the negative seven to three decimal places, you get zero. You get zero. And yet, if you put zero in the web work, it's not going to take it. And here's the reason why. Sure, 10 to the negative seven might round to zero, but it isn't zero. Zero is literally impossible. 10 to the negative seven is nearly impossible. And so to illustrate the point, 10 to the negative seven, once every blue moon. But every now and then, you'll get your blue moon. I thought that might help explain some of the concepts. Thank you for staying after. Y'all enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>